I'm here with SciShow resident and shark scientist Jada Elcock to answer fish questions. I don't know where this video is gonna go. It might be an exclusive for people who donate to the Learnathon. I might just put it on Hank's channel. We just got a lot of fish questions and I wanna know Jada's answers. <laughs> so we're doing this. Scream in Dream asks, I was asked how many catfish you could fit in a minivan and I said 35 to 40. Are my siblings right to clown me about this? Which, I have no idea which way they would clown you. That's it my- It could be way more or way less. I know. My whole thing was it depends on the species. Of course. Because there are so many different catfishes. Red-tailed catfish get like five and a half feet long. You're gonna fit way less of them in a car than you would like Hold a on. 10 inch long bullhead catfish. <laughs> what? They're five and a half feet long. <laughs> I so they're just them. the size of people. Yes. You're five and a half feet long. Correct. <laughs> so it, in that way, it depends on the car. But if it's just like a normal sedan, five. Yeah, well, Because so they'd like, just be sitting there. Well, in the car he together. didn't say comfortably. Right. You, I do like the idea of five catfish just carpooling. Chilling in the car, yeah. <laughs> okay, he did say minivan, so that's making me think seven seater car. New definition to carpool. Oh, that took me a second. Oof. Professional. <laughs> Comedian. Also, then the question is like, are you taking the seats out or are you leaving right. the seats in? Seats in. Seats that in. Would be a, yeah, it's not like a clown car. Okay. It's I, not like spe specific to fit the most catfish in. Okay. Normal car, how many ca catfish can you fit in there? I'm thinking... Billions. No. Well, maybe if you got eggs. Yeah. Catfish counts. fries? Yeah. This question goes so deep, man. Yeah. You... Okay. If we're thinking... People can't ask questions and think like that and think that there's going to be an answer there's and that not. like 30 is not is a crazy number. No, 30 is a totally normal number. Yeah. You could fit, I mean, you probably fit like 20 of those big catfish in if you just sort of like lay them on top of each other. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking seven to like fit in the seats and yeah. then like two laying across the laps of the ones in the back. Yeah. Two it's like high middle. school. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're really, you're packing it in. It's senior ditch day. Only one person's got a car. <laughs> and you're all going to the lake because we all want to your return. Catfish. I'm going with like 25 max of yeah, those big ones. Of the biggest catfish. Not comfortably, but yeah. could you fit them? Yes. But, it, but the catfish that I think of when I think of a catfish are like the hundreds. Yes. I also have the spatial awareness of a walnut. You know what I am totally down for? If somebody wants to code like catfish car tetris i would totally play that game oh my god that's tetris so but slippery and a little bit stinky with whiskers i don't think i liked any of that description <laughs> <laughs> tetris but wet no <laughs> wetris <laughs> yeah we got there eventually tetaluta uh-huh how do some salmon live in both salt water and fresh water there are two different i guess groups names for fish that live in both freshwater and saltwater. There's the ones that go from saltwater to freshwater oh. uh, and then back to salt, like from saltwater and go into freshwater in order to spawn. And that would be like a salmon. Those are mm. anadromous. Anadromous? Anadromous. Your other ones that go the other way, like an American eel that lives in freshwater but spawns in saltwater, those are oh. catadromous. I'm trying to figure out what the roots of these words are. Couldn't tell you. Anion and cation? Actually, that's maybe what it is because here is what I'm thinking. The answer to the question of like how do they do that has to do with when they retain and expel salt. Yeah. And so when they are in freshwater, they expel the salt and they filter a lot more water and yeah. like pee a lot basically so that they're able to match their cells, match the salinity of the water around them, the saltiness. Mm -hmm. And then the other way around, they retain the salt to try and match the salinity of the water around them and then right. they pee less. So that's so just they actually how it works. change the salinity of their cells? Yeah, cuz if you have too much salt in your cells in freshwater, then the water is gonna to wanna to flood right. into those cells because osmosis, and then your cells are going to explode. Yeah, I thought maybe they were just like really good at pumping the water out really fast and maintaining that. Kind of both. Yeah. Yeah, okay. pumping the water and also like either retaining or right. getting rid but of the But they actually change the salinity of the mm -hmm. cells. So like a, an ocean fish has more saline cells, like the inside of their cells yeah. is just like matches the water. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem, that, that like that, is not the same. So like right. you go from like matching the salinity of your water to suddenly not matching the salinity. If you want to experience what it is like, put, don't do this, but it's like it's like when you get fresh water up your nose, 
So like your body is more saline than fresh water, and if you get fr- like saline water up or fresh water up your nose, it burns. If you get perfectly pH, like saline balanced water up your nose, like if you're using a neti pot, it doesn't burn because it's the same sal- salinity. But if you get ocean water up your nose, it burns even more than fresh water because again, it is even further away from the concentration gradient of your body. Yeah. Again, don't inhale water up your nose. D- not on purpose. Don't do it on purpose. No. It sounded like I was telling you to do it on purpose. <laughs> don't. You can use an eddy pot, but use it properly. Don't and put salt don't, water in it. I'm not a doctor. Yeah, don't put like double the salt in it just to Ooh, see what it feels like. That would be so bad. But that's what's happening to the fish. And so like, if you are not a fish that's able to do that transition, then going it into... would be extremely, I would think, painful. Yeah, and it would kill you. And then bull sharks are similar, but I don't think... It's not necessarily like a they go into freshwater right. to spawn. It's they not, just yeah. can do it. So is that specifically the word for when a fish spawns in a separate salinity? That is my understanding, okay. yeah. Versus just being able to do it. Yeah. Which a lot of fish can do for sometimes not for a very long time. Right. Or it's just like stresses them out. They do it and they head back. Yeah. Bull sharks can do it for uh, an amount of time that I personally believe is unreasonable, but... Um, they just do it. And it's, yeah. I respect it. It's very cool. When I was a child I, at uh, the Scholastic Book Fair, I got a book called The Fast Talking Dolphin about a dolphin that fell out of a helicopter into a pond in the mountains and became friends with a boy and the, do- the dolphin could talk. And the dolphin began to get sick because it was in fresh water. And oh. so they had to get the dolphin out of the pond and into to fresh water. And I started to read this book to my son recently, and he made me stop because the dolphin was sick, and that was not okay. Oh. Yeah. This is a fiction story. Oh, yes. my oh, wait, goodness. You said, you said they were talking. I Yeah, the dolphin I was now. speaking English. Yeah, no, okay, never mind. You never know. Weird things happen. They drop fish out of planes to, like, restock ponds. Sure. And then sometimes the fish are like, what's up? Yeah, they just come out and they're like, hello, my name is Hank Green. Michael the Mexican asks, can fish hear as clearly as we do in air? Oh, who I knows? I don't have a, an answer to this question, but I have things that could play into right. an answer. That's a very Hank Green answer. Yeah. That's, you're, very, you're in it. You, nice. know, you know how to do this job. What I do know is that sound moves faster and farther in water than it does in air. And fish can hear, they have ears, they're internal ears, but they have these bones, these inner ear bones called otoliths that they can use to hear. We also have those. Yes. Because we're fish. Fish sensory systems are also like so difficult to fully understand. <laughs> yeah. I yes. Mean, we can't talk to any of them about what it's exactly. like. Exactly. And it's quite different from us. And they, they have like this lateral line system that's like basically a tactile sense that like can sense very minute like movements and vibrations in the water so like you know sound waves they could potentially pick that up with mm-hmm. their lateral line as well um they can use their air-filled swim bladders to kind of like send those vibration signals up to their otoliths oh wow so there's so much that they can do but to be able to definitively say yes they can hear better than us or no they don't i don't think that i could answer that question well oh. i would think that that probably falls down to like the individual organism exactly so yeah. like are you a very scent focused or are you a very uh, sound focused organism or not like we're pretty sound focused right but we're more it's it's less that we're good at detecting very faint sounds because this is important senses is not just like how good are you at detecting very faint things it's also the variety like what's mm-hmm. the, the the spectrum that you can sense smells or you know the the visual spectrum or the the frequency spectrum of pressure waves in sound but we're also very good at picking out individual uh, bits mm-hmm. that's the thing that human ears are very good at and humans brains because right. it allows us to understand speech i was going to say also there's then the argument of is an organism actually hearing if it doesn't respond to that stimulus So that's like a whole other thing. So there's like fish studies that are like, yeah, they can hear it. But then some people argue, no, they can't because they didn't react to this. Oh, interesting. Um, But if they, I mean, there must be a use for the sense. Yeah. But fish, like the big, uh, there are much bigger deals for fish than, than sound, I feel like, because there are, uh, finding each other for mating is Mm -hmm. a really big deal, but I feel like it's less of, less important for knowing what's going on around you. Something can sneak up to you to you in water Mm -hmm. and not make a lot of sound yeah but they are gonna make like electric fields change yes so a lot of fish can sense that Mm -hmm. and also there's going to be visible and so fish have good eyes and oftentimes 360 vision Mm -hmm. and they they do hear 
things. There are there are fish that produce sounds to be able to like communicate, whether that be like competition or mm -hmm. mating or whatever else the case is. So it's not that they never respond to like an auditory stimulus. Yeah. It's just that which ones do they respond to? And there's also then evidence that some fish can hear only like lower frequencies mm -hmm. and some fish can hear a wider range of frequencies. So that point of like what, how much more variety of something could you detect right. than another thing goes into sensory systems as well. All of this is to say, we don't have an answer. <laughs> and also I, I think it's very, it, it's cool and important to recognize that our sensorium, like the way that we experience the world, is specific to humans. It's unique to humans, but that's not unique about humans. Right. Every organism has a specific set of ways that it experiences the world that is different from other species. Mm -hmm. And that's wild. Yeah, it's, a, it's a whole universe of different ways of sensing and experiencing the world. And like they, like they we kind of live in different worlds from each other. Yeah, shark sensory systems are awesome, and I have a lot of friends that are studying those as well. Shark noses and... Mm -hmm. You know the ampullae of Lorenzini, their electroreception, and mm -hmm. I like that uh, you can you can learn a little bit about an organ uh, by its name. So, like nose, for example, is an organ that smells, and it obviously was named by somebody a very long time ago who was like nose. And then the shark receptors are called the ampullae of Lorenzini, yeah, because we named that later on, but yeah, more recently when it was like we got to name things after guys, yeah who do stuff so that he can live forever inside of the ampullae. This is something that has always felt so odd to me. Just like naming, <laughs> Yeah. I, I don't know. This is Bernard's Pit Viper. I made that up, but like why yeah. are this whole organism, oh, Yeah. why does it have to be named after you, sir? Because, yeah, because I don't want to die. Well, I hate to tell you, but <laughs> it's gonna happen at some point. Someday your bird will be extinct, sir. Also, they're renaming a lot of birds now too. They are, yeah. For good reason. Well, I think, like, you know, you could say, like, we don't want to name a bird after this guy who turned out to be a jerk, but you can yeah. also say, like, it'd be better to have the bird named after, like, what it looks like or acts like. That one specifically, because yeah. I, well, I mean, both reasons, because, like, why, let's not name things after racists, but also, let's name things for what they look like, because then it's just, like, yeah. this bird is Much named after... Much easier to remember! <laughs> yeah, I'm like, this bird is named after some guy. I'm like, okay, well, there's 800 million types of chickadees, so, like, which one is it? Yeah. It's just, like, the white-breasted one. I'm like, that would okay. make a lot more sense. That's helpful. Next one? Next one. Okay. Why human teeth? What? Oh, about fish! Yeah! <laughs> Sheep's yeah. heads? Sheep's heads, uh... Pakus as well. Pakus. Mm -hmm. And then there's the ones that have the pharyngeal teeth that look like molars, but all packed together like corn cob. Oh my god, I, that's the one I really, really don't like. Well, because you have to imagine chewing with your throat. <laughs> you I don't them. have to imagine that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I I, prefer... the, moment I, the moment I found out, I had, I had Emily Grassley show me just some, some pharyngeal teeth, and she was like, what do you think this is? And I'm like, I don't know, a fossilized corn? And she was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> the throat of a fish that is alive today. Yeah. Oy. Yeah, and then I was like, so it's in the throat? And she was like, and then I was like, and then I immediately imagined like chewing salad with my throat. I don't <laughs> like that at all. Human-like teeth are yeah. great for crushing and, and like grinding. And biting, too. And biting, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. biting hard things. They're perfect for kind of like a varied diet. Pakus have like a varied diet where they're they will, like omnivores. They yeah, eat. they'll they'll eat a whole bunch of different stuff. I've seen people give them carrots and they can chomp right through it. Sure. Um, sheep's head will eat things like crabs and crustaceans. So they're like really chomping through those hard shells. Mm. And that is what like human teeth are very good at is like biting through hard stuff like that. I will never understand why it's not okay for us to chew ice cubes. I think it, all of this. Well, if it's not okay, then I don't want to be okay. Our teeth are uh, like these front teeth, which is a lot of like the, what the Paku and yeah. the sheep's head teeth look like. They're good for like scraping too, like uh -huh. a lot of like bone marrow scraping in early human history to get access to calories that yes. other animals didn't have access to. Mm -hmm. A lot of like grabbing and ripping off because mm -hmm. we have these hands too. And so this is just like a convergent evolution thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, where it's just like, the, like these organisms have to do somewhat similar things and you end up with teeth that look similar. Yep. They've converged on something that is useful for a variety of different things. Why including human teeth? Chomping and tearing yeah. and what and, have you. And then it gives us a little Uncanny Valley vibe to yeah. see a human thing on a non-human animal. A very non-human animal. Like a very... Yeah. 
I think it looks cute on the Paku, I'm not gonna lie. It's like a giant looking piranha it, type thing and you'd expect there to be like right. piranha teeth and uh -huh. it's just like a little human smile. I will say, uh, we've known each other for a couple of days now mm -hmm. and I haven't yet found a fish that you don't like. You think they're all great and cute and like, oh, look at that face and great white sharks look so derpy. And I'm like, I guess, but also, have you seen what they do? Their best. They do their best. They do their best. <laughs> Unlike me. They gotta eat. Sometimes. Well, <laughs> I know what my best looks like and sometimes I don't do it. Retweet. You can't be at your best all the time. That's right. <laughs> anyway, that is my answer to why human teeth. <laughs> Got a little off track, I, but very yeah. positive. How would you feel if a shark had human hands? Would that do it? That would be so funny, and here's why. She'd <laughs> like it. She's like, oh, I think it would be so cute. It's funny because I'm just imagining instead of, they don't have arms, I'm just imagining like, hands for fins, and then they're just swimming around like this. And then one on the back. Exactly. Oh. Two for the tail fin. Like, come on. They could clap. I think it'd be funny. <laughs> I didn't say cute. I said funny. <laughs> it's different. I think it would be awful. <laughs> I think it would be so bad. Well, that's your Well, opinion. it's just like hands are so specific to humans. You know, you imagine like hands on a dog and I just get really upset. Well, Jada, thank you for answering more fish questions with me here on Wherever We Are. You're and welcome. I never know <laughs> what I'm doing. That's okay. You can find Jada at Sophistication on Twitter and TikTok and Sophistication underscore on Instagram, where I think you spend most of your time. Yes. And I will convince you to make a YouTube channel someday. It'll happen. And then I get to feature you on it. Maybe I'll just save one of these and we can just put it on your YouTube channel. It might be my first YouTube video. Okay. Let's record another one right now and we'll put it on your YouTube channel that you're going to create. Perfect. Okay. Two quick things at the end of this video. And yeah, there's no video during this part because I don't have time for that. So instead, I'll put something here. I honestly don't know what. The Complexly Ornithon ends this week. There's over 70 people at Complexly who are working all of the time to make the best possible educational content available for free on YouTube and some other places as well. The people at Complexly take that work super seriously and when they talk about what they want to do, they only ever talk about impact. We could maybe make more money if we put more stuff behind paywalls, but that's not what they want to do because that limits the impact. So instead of us having our own streaming service, you could give us $60 a year, which is $5 a month. That's what you would be paying uh, for a streaming service if we had one, but this way we don't have to have one and we can have it be available for free for everybody. You do not have much time left to give during the Learnathon. And the second thing is that between the time when we recorded this and now, Jada has created a YouTube channel. It's called Sophistication, and I'll put it on the screen now, and you can go subscribe and also watch another video that the two of us made together. Okay, that's the actual end of the video. I have never been this busy in my life, but I'm enjoying it.